Yes, and this is uh, Catchbase 101. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Catchbase server, uh, some of the architecture, installation, um, how things work underneath the hood, um, what makes up Catchbase server, scaling um, Catchbase server horizontally, and some of the key concepts um, within Catchbase um, for people who are new to Catchbase or are still learning about Catchbase to get a a solid grasp of how Catchbase how Catchbase works, um, and sort of the sort of paradigm that you're working in with Catchbase. Um, we have a lot of material to cover um, in this hour, so I'm going to go relatively fast and hopefully have a good amount of time for demo and questions. Uh, we'll stop midway for a few questions, and at the end we'll follow with the remaining questions. So first we want to cover uh, a little bit of the architecture of Catchbase. So what um, often people don't uh, really know is the history of Catchbase. So uh, some of our key founders were, um, you know, Memcached contributors. And Memcached was in, uh, created in the early 2000s um, for LiveJournal. And um, these key um, contributors uh, created a product uh, called Membase which was a distributed and persisted key value store. It was basically a distri distributed memcached. Uh, and this uh, evolved uh, into Couchbase, a document store with JSON support, um, adding MapReduce indexes, Elasticsearch integration, and cross data center replication. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that helps people understand Couchbase. It's also one of the migration paths um, for for um, uh, existing applications to move to Couchbase, uh, uh, almost all deployments use Memcached um, and involving it um, and replacing uh, your data store with Couchbase often involves using um, Couchbase in place of Memcached um, as a migration step. Um, we still have a lot of the structure of Memcached in terms of key value um, um, structure and we also, you know, actually support Memcached SDKs still, although our own SDKs are more performant. So Couchbase servers' core principles are easy scalability, consistent high performance, always on 24-365, and the flexible data model with JSON. I think that, uh, you know, even as Couchbase evolves, these core principles uh, remain tenants for uh, our releasing of features. You know, we, we ensure that we maintain these core principles as we grow our feature set over time. Each Couchbase server is identical. There's no idea of having different types of Couchbase servers uh, glued together. They're all identical in, in within your cluster. It's made up of two different parts, a data manager and a cluster manager. The data manager handles all the binary operations, the 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 uh, interface with client SDKs and uh, persistence, and the cluster manager basically manages uh, or interacts with all the nodes in the cluster and you know maintains monitoring and health um, and configuration. The data manager is uh, written in C and you know contains the you know RAM cache, the indexing and persistence management, and then uh, the server and cluster management is in Erlang and all that communication as well. Um, the key ports are 8092 for querying views, 11211 uh, for um, backwards compatible back compatibility with Memcached D, uh, 11210 for our internal clients and our client SDKs, and then port 8091 is our configuration port and our admin interface. Um, and then there's a number of ports uh, for the Erlang communication between nodes. Couchbase is organized like a key value store. That means uh, we're doing key value pairs for storage of data. Uh, key is a UTF-8 string, um, up to 256 bytes. You can store strings, numbers, daytime, Boolean, binary. Um, binary data is stored as base 64 encoded. You can also store complex data types, and this differs from relational databases where you have to uh, normalize uh, complex data types like um, hashes or dictionaries or arrays or lists into separate tables and use joins. In the case of Couchbase, being JSON documents, which is basically a special type of string, 
um, you can store complex data types um, and avoid impedance mismatch where your in-memory data structures don't match your on-disk data structures. Uh, there is no enforced schema. It's implicit um, based on your um, model and your application. Your, 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 your data model and your application implicitly defines a schema. There is no enforced schema. And so schema changes can actually be programmatic. You can, you can dynamically change schema. Um, and one document does not have to match the next document. Um, so you can have sort of optional JSON keys and values um, from document to document, and they can vary. This also means that you, this is part of the 24365. You don't have to take catch base down in order to make changes to your JSON documents and, and schema or your implicit schema, unlike relational systems where every change requires you to take the database down, do a migration, and bring it back up. So Couchbase is a, a key value store, and we have uh, two different parts to every uh, data item, every document. The first part is the metadata, and all metadata, including the key for the document, is stored in RAM. It's always kept in RAM. That way, certain operations, like a get operation, can return uh, null or nil uh, immediately uh, if a certain key doesn't exist. And then there's also the document value, the JSON itself or, or the other data, if it's an integer or number or string or binary, is the document value itself. And uh, those are uh, kept in RAM as well, just like uh, in Memcached, those are kept in RAM as well, as much as possible given your allocation of RAM. Um, and if the RAM gets full, the not recently, we maintain a not recently used list to uh, eject from RAM uh, documents uh, when the RAM cache is full. Uh, that's not often the case with our customer deployments. Most, uh, most of our customers actually size their cluster to, to contain all their values um, for super high performance. So in the case of uh, how this works, uh, this is the architecture for Couchbase. You see you have two different parts here. You have the eventual persistence engine and you have the RAM cache. When you do a get operation, it's coming directly from the RAM cache. When you do a storage operation, which is a set, add, or replace, it's going to RAM cache first, and then it's uh, added to disk write queue and replication queue. It's persisted to disk and also pushed out to another cache-based node for replica. This means you can read your own writes, and I'll talk, show you a little diagram of consistency here. Here I'm you know, creating a new item or replacing an existing item. And when I do a get, it's immediately coming from that RAM cache. So the disk write queue and the replication queue are background um, processes writing to disk and replicating. Um, and I'll show that again. When I do an operation here, it immediately updates RAM cache. And if I do a get operation afterwards, it's reading from that RAM cache. So it's writing to the RAM cache, reading from the RAM cache immediately. So you have immediate consistency on, on all your data. This is very important to understand. Some of the other NoSQLs are eventually consistent, and you have to have rules and uh, logic to deal with you know, having multiple versions of items. In Couchbase, there is no multiple versions of items. Um, it, it is a consistent database. Now, if your um, if your RAM cache is full and you you know have a high velocity of writes going in and your RAM cache is full, you know this what happens is that we eject some dot values from RAM. First, we actually eject replica values and then we eject active values um, from RAM to to free up RAM cache. Um, and when you pull an item off disk, uh, I'm sorry, when you do a cache miss, when you pick a key that's not actually in the RAM cache, it'll pull it off disk into the RAM cache and return it back to the you know, client uh, application server. Um, this is, again, like I said, this is not often the case because most people size their cluster to contain all their documents values as well. Um, but if, if you do if you don't do that, um, this is what happens. It will eject values, um, and then when you request an item that is not in the RAM cache, it'll pull it from disk 
into RAM cache and then return back to your uh, application server. Clients connect directly to cache-based nodes. Um, the first time it connects, it retrieves a um, cluster map. So Couchbase is, does uh, hash key partitioning. Um, so it takes the key of the document, it hashes it, and it has a 1024 partitions. And when you hash the key, it results in a number from uh, 0 to 1023 here. So in this case, like if I did the hash function on just deep at couchbase.com, uh, it's going to result in a number from 0 to 1023. Let's just say that hashes to 25. And then the cluster map has a, a map of mapping between the partitions and the IP of the server responsible within the cache base cluster. In this case, I only have one node, so all the partitions are on that node. But I'll, I'll give a demonstration uh, later um, or a diagram later of what happens when um, you add nodes to your cluster. So in this case, the in our client SDKs, they maintain a map of this partition to uh, catch base node. Um, and when it changes, it, it also, they, they are responsible for keeping it updated. This is different than, say, um, how some other, you know, NoSQL databases work where there's actually a master node that, that everything, everyone connects to, and that will redirect requests to an appropriate node um, based on sharding or some other mechanism. In this case, we reduce latencies because each application server connected to the Couchbase cluster communicates directly with the Couchbase server responsible for that key. So let's show a little bit about how uh, a horizontal scale rebalance here uh, works. So in this case, I have two application servers connected to a one Couchbase node. I have 1024 partitions on that. Um, and a total of 1024 partitions. In this case, I also have it configured with eight gigs of RAM and three IO workers. When I do a rebalance operation, I add another uh, server to Couchbase, the Couchbase cluster, I add another um, server to the cluster. It moves half of the partitions over to the new cluster, I'm sorry, to the new machine. Um, and the clients and the Couchbase servers Get, uh, get their cluster map updated, and now the application servers will connect directly to each catch base node. Uh, and our total working set in terms of uh, available RAM is now 16 gigabytes, and we have six IO workers. We still have 1024 partitions. And we take these two um, nodes, uh, two node cluster, and we're going to expand it to a four node cluster. Very similar rebalance operation happens. 256 uh, from each, 256 partitions from each get moved to the two new servers. A cluster map uh, gets updated, and then the clients also get updated with their cluster map. Of course, this happens very quickly. After the rebalance is complete, uh, the, the cluster maps are, uh, this is a bit exaggerated in terms of how slow it is. The cluster maps are almost instant. Um, and now I have uh, 32 gigs of, of RAM and 12 I.O. workers. So as you can see, in order to scale Couchbase, you're scaling horizontally. You're adding multiples of, of your capacity, um, redistributing your partitions, and you know, creating a you know, a faster cluster with more I.O., more RAM, you know, and more, uh, more distribution. And that your application application servers are still connecting directly to these nodes. This can all this all happens while uh, Couchbase is online. This is not something that happens, um, you know, independently um, where you have to take down the cluster, add nodes, and bring it back up. This is all done uh, always on 24-365. So this is one of the advantages of Couchbase is you can do these things uh, in a live cluster unlike other systems and relational systems. Um, so the RAM, CPU, and I.O. So all metadata for all documents are kept in RAM. So that's 64 bytes plus the length of the key. Um, so keys vary in length. If you use UUID or use email address or usernames, for instance, that'll uh, be in addition to the 64 bytes. It'll keep as many document values as possible based on your RAM quota. Um, and then it'll eject not recently used items from RAM when you get to about 90% of your RAM quota uh, to maintain uh, space for um, 
uh, incoming new values. Also, um, RAM is used for file system cache for views which come off disk. Um, that's our MapReduce indexes. Um, so we leave RAM for the OS to actually have a sizable file system cache for views. CPU is uh, primarily uh, utilized for indexing, uh, monitoring, and cross data center replication. We recommend at least four cores, um, plus an additional core for each design document and an additional core for each uh, cross data center replicated bucket. Disk I.O., which can be spinning or uh, flash, um, uh, you know, we're storing persisted documents and all our indexes come off disk. Um, and we use a append-only disk format. Compaction happens online because we're using an uh, append-only format to increase um, speed of writing to disk. Um, uh, we have, uh, and you'll see, uh, you'll see in our demo, uh, online compaction where it'll, you know, eliminate uh, or delete tombstones and rebalance trees. Uh, all during um, online, while it's online. For higher performance, um, if you're on uh, AWS, you know, having multiple EBS volumes and high IOPS um, also increases your uh, disk throughput uh, performance. So these are our, our operations in cache base. We have get for retrieval. We have three storage operations, uh, set, add, and replace. Um, we have an anchor and decker, that's increment and decrement, those are for atomic counters. And then we have a compare and swap operation. All these operations are, are, are over a binary socket for high performance. Port 11.2.10 is our client SDK um, port, and then 11.2.11 is the standard memcached port. Of course, I highly recommend using our cache based SDKs, they're going to be more performant. Uh, then your uh, memcached SDKs, um, which are also available, which you can use. But cache-based SDKs have been optimized uh, uh, for higher performance, and you'll notice uh, higher performance with them. We do have HTTP operations, and that's primarily for view querying, our index querying, uh, there's range queries, index key match queries, set match queries, aggregate reduces, and group level and grouping queries. Those are all on port 8092, um, and that's over HTTP. Um, and now I can take a couple minutes for a few questions. Yes, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, so the first one is from uh, Shahid. When a RAM cache is full and it moves to replica data, should it, write, should it write it to disk, or what happens? No, if there's still capacity in the RAM cache when you uh, start removing uh, replica from RAM, uh, it'll continue writing to RAM cache first. But now if you become completely full, um, which, you know, generally if you look at our sizing guidelines, we, you know, it, it's better performance to not be completely full. But, but yes, it'll pull off disk and then uh, when you do it again, it'll pull it off disk into RAM cache and then return to the client. So that increases your latency a little bit, just like any time you have any disk I.O. access. Perfect. And another question is, in your horizontal scale example, the total partition are always 1,024. Is 1,024 the max partition in a cluster? It's actually sort of uh, uh, not important. Um, yeah, you know, basically we picked that number many years ago, and it's been a good number. It was arbitrary. It could have been, you know, ten thousand or a hundred thousand or fifty thousand. You know, it doesn't. The number of partitions doesn't matter. That it is partitioned it matters. Um, that means we're distributing our data evenly across the cluster. Um, in a couch-based cluster, even a very sizable one like say Orbits, which is quite large, um, we only have say thirty servers. So. Uh, having more partitions doesn't actually change performance. Uh, it was just an arbitrary choice um, of 1024. So you never have more than, you'll, you'll never have 1024 servers in your cluster. Uh, you'd have to be the biggest deployment on earth. Um, but usually in, in those cases where you have large clusters, often 
you know, customers will split it into multiple clusters um, to reduce inter-cluster inter, uh, communication. Thank you, Justin. So let's go back to the presentation, then we will answer uh, more questions uh, at the end. Okay, thank you. So installing uh, Couchbase server is fast, and I'm going to actually demo it as well. Um, you go to couchbase.com slash download. We have releases for Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, uh, Windows, and Mac. Um, we also have uh, AMI. And if you are on your Amazon console uh, and you, you know, create a new server, you'll see um, four different um, versions here. The, the top two... Um, at least when I searched, the top two were the ones that included our support contract uh, in pricing. Um, and then there's the mobile sync gateway for the Couchbase mobile project. Um, and that one's free. And then at the very bottom there, um, you have the enterprise free. And that does not include our support contract. But it's a very quick install if you don't want to do it manually um, yourself. Um, I believe it's on Ubuntu, actually. Um, you know, this AMI is very uh, very useful, and I use it all the time myself when I'm creating uh, servers on Amazon. So to, you know, finish, uh, once you do your install, you know, to complete your setup, you browse to localhost 8091 if you're doing it on your own computer, or if you're doing it on Amazon, you want to use the, the public um, IP address port 8091. And this, this will be the first screen you see, uh, set up uh, Couchbase. Um, so the first thing you, it you know, does is you know, you've got the, the disk storage paths that you can configure. And then you're at the very bottom, in this case, we're starting a new cluster. And it, it defaults to 60% of uh, available RAM or maximum RAM. Now, this number is important. This is the maximum RAM Couchbase could use potentially. Um, and you want to actually generally leave this number. Um, even if you're storing, uh, installing it on your local machine, it's not going to actually use this RAM unless you fill it up with that much data. And you can actually configure your bucket or your database to use less RAM than that. But the, changing this value requires using the command line. And I highly recommend just leaving this number as is. It is configured at about 60% available RAM to leave RAM for file system cache for index views um, for the OS to actually use. The next step will be sample buckets. Um, if you're new to Couchbase, uh, it's a good idea to um, check the beer sample box. Um, we have um, sample apps that you can download and check out that correspond to that beer sample um, data set um, and the indexes. Um, so that's useful. You can install it later, um, but it's useful to go ahead and do it now if you're new to Couchbase. Um, now it's um, configuring the default bucket. And the default bucket, this is where you can decide how much RAM that this bucket or database can actually um, hold. And you know, here I put 300 megabytes. Um, this is uh, Below that is the read-write concurrency. That's the number of I.O. workers. Um, you know, we default to three, but you can have more. Um, and then at the very bottom, which I didn't make bigger, was flush. And if you want to programmatically uh, clear out your um, bucket and with of all data, um, you know, via the SDKs, you have to enable it. We put that in there so that you don't um, accidentally delete data pro programmatically um, um, in production databases and production cache base. Uh, you know, then there's update notifications, agreeing to terms, and finally, your server password. I highly recommend make, making this, especially on your own local laptop, making this easy to remember. You can retrieve it later if you need to, but it's kind of a pain, so I just do ASDF, ASDF on mine, on my local machine. And then your setup is complete. You have a running cache-based server. So setting up SDKs, I just want to make a reminder, I'm covering this in much more detail on Thursday in Couchbase 102, um, but I'll quickly go over um, a little bit of um, setting up SDKs. So we support Java.net, .NET, uh, PHP, Ruby, Python, C, and Node.js. 
We also have community clients for Go, Erlang, Clojure, um, Perl, and some um, other Node.js libraries. Um, the PHP, Node, Ruby, and Python clients are all wrappers around the C library, libcouchbase, so that must be installed first. For those of you that use those languages, it's important to understand you, you have to install the C library first before you install the Ruby gem or the PHP uh, SO, et cetera. So um, uh, when you go to the couchbase.com slash communities, um, there's getting started guides and installation guides um, and uh, tutorials that uh, correspond to the beer sample uh, data, data set. Um, Remember to install the libcouchbase C library first before installing these clients. Um, on Mac, make sure you, before you do the libcouchbase and, and SDK install, make sure you've got Xcode and the command line tools installed. Use Homebrew and do uh, you know brew update, upgrade, and Doctor to make sure everything is is um, up to date. If you haven't done that in a while. Um, Installing libcouchbase is pretty simple. You know, on Mac, it's a brew install libcouchbase. On PC, you download the appropriate zip that corresponds to the Visual Studio uh, that you're using on your on your Windows machine. Um, you know, Red Hat and Ubuntu, you get the the you know apt-get or yum repositories, and then you do a sudo yum install or apt-get install. And all the instructions are on the couchbase.com/communities/c/getting-started. Um, and that's for you know PHP, Ruby, Python, C, and Node.js. The Java and .NET have native SDKs. Um, again, more on I'll be covering much more of this on Thursday in the Catchbase 102. So please uh, feel free to register for that, and we can I'll be talking a lot more in more detail about how to get set up and do operations. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the admin interface. So we, we installed Catchbase Server. And we've got this admin interface. Uh, when you install it, you don't have any operations going, but if you do sort of a load test to introduce some operations, which I can show you, I have like a simple load test that I'm going to go through. Um, these first uh, couple lines, uh, the first two rows of these graphs uh, talk about the you know total ops per second that are currently happening, um, how many retrievals off disk, um, how many retrieval ops, how many storage ops, your deletions, RAM quota, you know, this low watermark and high watermark, um, sorry, so this is the amount of memory used at the end, and the low watermark and high watermark are basically what decides, you know, where, when the ejection from uh, RAM takes place, and at the low watermark, it'll begin ejection of replicas from RAM, and then it'll, you know, at the high watermark, it'll be begin ejection of active items from RAM. In those cases, you'll get, um, you'll get, you know, it'll be coming off disk for uh, any retrieval operations. So, and then that first, uh, that first column there with a temporary out of memory. If your RAM is completely full, you've passed the high water mark, and you still have high velocity writes. Obviously, at this, you, you, at this point, you you were probably, you know, scaling your cluster up. Um, hopefully, earlier than this point. But you can get uh, temporary out of memory um, if you have very high velocity writes and it's trying to eject and your writes, write speed is actually, your write operation pace or velocity is higher than your uh, ability to eject uh, from RAM, you'll get uh, temporary out of memory responses back to your client SDK, which you'll then have to handle and you know retry your operations. This only happens when you're absolutely full. Um, and basically every way possible. Um, then the next two rows are uh, focused a little bit more on disk. So this is your how many uh, items you're creating on disk or updating. Um, this is related, the third one is related to 
the cache misses, how many times you're reading off disk, um, your current disk write queue size. Um, this is your docs on disk compress. This is your, the second one is the docs on disk uh, uncompressed. Um, the fragmentation, so we use an append only format, so the amount that, that those files are fragmented, um, it shows there, and at certain thresholds, it will compact and reduce the fragmentation. As you can see, it's sort of a regular graph where it increases, hits a threshold, and then decreases. That decrease is uh, compaction. Uh, and then the total disk usage. Uh, so this disk queue size, this is important to, to recognize for sort of DevOps, is that if you don't have enough I.O., you might see, start seeing something like this where your disk write queue is growing indefinitely, that means you need more disk I.O. You need to scale horizontally so you have more um, I.O. writers and you're distributing your write load across more servers. Um, so if you see an ever-growing disk write queue, then that's a clear indicator that you don't have enough disk I.O. Um, the, so the partition map, those partitions internally are called vBuckets, and in the admin console, see we have a separate section called vbucket resources and this actually shows more detail of, of what's happening there uh, some of it is similar to the summary information so but this also shows when you're doing a rebalance what's happening so you have active partitions you have the replica partitions and pending during a rebalance um, you know your, your item count your residency rate uh, you know how your creations when your RAM is full, this will be your ejections. It'll, you'll see graphs for your ejections. This is the you know the document values in RAM and the metadata in RAM, you know for your vBuckets. One quick note on Mac, which is where I pulled these uh, screenshots from. There's only 64 partitions, uh, not 1024. And the reason was we didn't want to change default file descriptor limits that uh, for some reason OS X. It defaults to very low um, file descriptor limits, and so we didn't want to change it, um, you know, just for Couchbase. So we just reduced the number of partitions to 64. What is important is that you don't, you can't do cross data center replication between your Mac and a non-Mac operating system because the partitions won't match uh, between, say, you know, Red Hat and your OS X um, installation, and so. Don't try and do the uh, cross-data center replication between them. Other than that, everything else is uh, the same. Um, the third uh, view down there is uh, the disk queues. You have specific graphs for disk queues. You know, again, it's active partitions, you know, replica, and the pending during rebalance. Um, this is the queue size, how fast you are filling, how fast you're writing to disk or draining. And then the average age, if there is a delay between the, the fill and the drain, you'll see this in, uh, I think it's in microseconds, um, the average age of queue items. And I'm going to see if I can try and do this on, in my demo. Um, I, I might be able to achieve it because uh, this is an old Mac with a, just an a old spinning disk, 5400 RPM. I think I can get um, an average age in there. Uh, it's hard to actually see if you have good disk I.O., oh, it's going to always end up being kind of zero, um, but I think I can uh, accomplish it. So let's go ahead and I'm going to install Couchbase on this machine here. Um, I already downloaded it. Uh, it's a zip file off uh, the Enterprise Mac Edition 2.2.2, to, uh, to, 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 and I'm going to go ahead and drag it to my Applications folder. And I'm going to uh, run Couchbase. Okay. And then this is, I have one in, up in the cloud, and I'll show a demo of scaling. Um, so I'm going to go localhost. I'm going to take the defaults. I don't have a lot of RAM on this machine. Um, I'm not using the beer sample, so just leave that. I only have one node of my cluster, but I am going to enable flush. Um, 
So I'm just setting up my default bucket here. Putting in my password. And there, got a running cache base. It's now booting up. There we go. I've got a running cache base. I have one server in my cluster. Um, I have one data bucket. And uh, so I'm going to open that so you can see the graphs here. Right now we've got nothing going on here. And I'm going to go ahead and I have a small Ruby program. You know, there's a few lines to generate load and different um, read and write ratios. So I'm going to run this. So let's keep this open here. And I'm going to start running it. The first step I'm going to do is create 100,000 uh, items. This, this little load test creates about 1. Point, it's about 1.6 million operations um, total. So uh, you can see on these graphs here um, that I have, you know, um, these are my ops per second. This first step is only doing creation. So this is my uh, sort of creation rate here. Um, you know, I'm doing about 2K to 2 to 4K per second here um, on my little core duo. Uh, you can see the disk creates. It's writing them to disk. I can show the disk queue here. So here, because I'm running a spinning disk and my machine's, you know, rather old and slow, um, you can see I have this fill rate and drain rate, and I almost have a little bit of delay there where items are staying in the queue a little bit long. Um, and that's just because of the rate. So now I change this and reach the next step. It's uh, creating 100,000 items and also retrieving 100,000 items. And you can see these gets are increasing here. Um, it's about um, uh, one half of the create rate. Um, and then at the next phase, it's going to increase. So you can see I'm you know, creating lots of, lots of items here and also retrieving a lot of items. Um, you can also see, you know, within the partitions themselves, you can see, you know, how much user data uh, I've got, how much metadata I've got uh, in RAM. So, you know, very useful. I mean, we, we have a very awesome interface. Our admin UI is very useful for seeing what's really going on under the hood. Um, and I, at the next phase, it's going to, um, you know, increase the amount of gets and another set of items. So what I also am going to do at the same time while this is running is in the cloud I have a cluster of two nodes and I'm going to, this is on Amazon um, through our right scale, uh, it's through Amazon. I've got four nodes up but only two are clustered together and um, you can see there, so I have two nodes. I actually have this here. I, I I have it actually pointed to the vBucket resources. You see, there's you know 1024 partitions. It's split on two different servers. I'm actually pointing to one of the servers right now, just one of the two. And you can see there's only there's half of the the partitions are here. What I'm going to do is add a few servers to this. Let's see, I've got the IPs here, so I'm going to add a server. And then add the second one. I'm going to add two at, at a time here. Those are the private IP addresses. Amazon. So now I'm going to add two new services clusters. So I'm doubling from two servers to four servers. When I do rebalance, it's going to start redistributing uh, the partitions across. And you can see the progress here. Um, and I'll show you a graph of what's happening. As you can see, uh, the active and replica buckets are being reduced off the server number one, and they're moving across to you know the other servers. So let's go ahead and pull up one of the newer servers. And you can see here the partitions are being moved to. Uh, this is one of the new servers. 
Um, they're being moved to there, you know, and this rebounds. So let's go back and I can see, you can see the progress so far. And then you can see the, the partitions increasing as they're moving across here. Um, you're getting replicas um, being set up on these machines and you're also getting partitions on these machines and you can see kind of the things moving. Um, let's go back to this is part three of this load test. I've got an uh, equal amount of creations and gets I've changed, it, I've changed the distribution and then now I've got more um, gets than creations, uh, three to two. So I changed the ratio from one to one to two to three to two. So now I've got twice as many gets. And right now it's actually that graph is, um, let's change the graph. The graph was discreates. And actually what I'm doing is replacing items. Now it's, well, this is continuing to load test. Oh, the rebound's finished already. Uh, so now I've got four nodes in the cluster. I can handle uh, quite a bit more. My total, total capacity of all, of all the, of all the nodes is 400 megabytes of RAM. Um, between four nodes, so they have 100, 100 megabytes each set up in this bucket. But my total capacity is actually 36 gigs. So my cluster quota is 36 gig, but this bucket, the beer sample, let's go ahead and create a default bucket here. Um, I'm going to do, you know, nine, nine gigs of RAM per, um, per machine. And this will be... Uh, So this uh, default bucket has 30 gigs, uh, 35 gigs of RAM available you know, across the four nodes. So, uh, oops. so this load test is still going. Um, this is kind of an old machine. I can only get about three to four K um, of ops per second using the Ruby uh, gem. I think Java is faster than the Ruby in Interpreter, even though Ruby wraps uh, the C library on this old machine, is about as about three to four K is what I can expect um, on Amazon with a large. I think you can expect about maybe 10, 12 K, and then when you get into the two XLs, you can probably expect about 20, 25 K per per node. Um, so this sort of wraps up our demo and I wanted to leave um, some time for questions um, about the architecture or anything we've talked about. Yes, we have a bunch of questions already coming so let's start from the first one from Libruzzi. Does rebalancing of the nodes has any effect on the efficiency of Couchbase? No, we prioritize um, our operations um, over the rebounds. So uh, theoretically, if you're pounding Couchbase server very hard, it'll make a uh, rebalance take uh, longer. Um, also, theoretically, you could, if you could generate enough operations, you could possibly make rebounds take a really long time where your write velocity exceeds our capacity to redistribute data. Although I, I, no one's been able to actually create a demo of that yet. But um, no, we prioritize operations over rebalance. So rebalance um, will happen uh, as secondary to operations themselves. Okay, we have a question from Shahid. What is a good number when allocating RAM quota for bucket? Is there a rule of thumb? Yes. The, the rule of thumb is that you've got, uh, and I can go back to this slide, You've got uh, 56, I'm sorry, 64 bytes of metadata 
plus the length of the key. So if you have, you know, a key length that is average around, um, you know, 15 characters or 20 characters, then you're adding 20 bytes to that. If you multiply that out, that's just your metadata. Now, if your average document size is about 1K, you know, you can kind of calculate out, you know, how much RAM you need to contain all the metadata plus the document values themselves. Of course, you don't want to size it to be exactly uh, exactly equal to that value. You want to have some capacity. It also depends a little bit on your data velocity, how quickly your um, your influx of data is. You might want to add additional capacity. Um, it also, I mean, some of the other dependencies to this, one of those tricky questions where you, it's hard to give a generic answer. If you're sort of an ad network and you want the highest performance, you really never want anything to ever come off disk or use disk in any way, in which case you have huge amounts of RAM to ensure that there's absolutely no disk um, being used for your binary operations um, so that you're never pulling off disk for any values. Um, you, in those cases, you can still use uh, like views and MapReduce indexes for your you know, sort of BI and analytics, even with the ad network, but you're still prioritizing you know, having all your document values in RAM. Another question we have from Srinath. Um, so in Couchbase, do we have to add servers just for replica? Well, there's a minimum number of servers that you need to have a replica. Uh, you have to have at least two, and that means um, you have 512 active partitions on on the first node, and then you have 512 on active partitions on the second node, and then each one will have 512 replicas on the corresponding other node. Uh, when you have three nodes in the cluster, you know you have two replicas. You have um, uh, you have two, uh, two, two nodes that contain replicas. Um, it, it also depends on the number of replicas you configure. So yes, you have to have more than one, at least, you know, at least two nodes in your clusters to have replicas, at least three nodes in your cluster to have two replicas. Um, so in the case of failover, your replica partition becomes promoted to active and then the maps get updated. So your replica partitions might live on another node. If that node goes down, um, if the primary node goes down, the replica partitions on the other nodes get promoted to being active. And this can happen either automatically um, in the interface under settings. You have the auto failover. When you enable it, you know the minimum timeout is 30 seconds. If it can't access the server for 30 seconds, it'll auto failover. Um, most of our customers actually do manual failover, and I can show you what that where that is. So if I wanted to, if this node was failing, for instance, um, and I could fail over that node. If I'm having problems with that server, I can fail over that node, and then the replicas on these three nodes will be promoted to being primary. Thank you, Justin. Uh, one more question, and then we can close the presentation before answering more questions. Uh, it's about rebalancing. Um, so can you go over again what happened in case of rebalancing? And uh, when you rebalance uh, your cluster, are partition actually moved to another node or are they duplicated? Um, they're duplicated until the rebalance is complete. And then, then it'll signal, it signals to the other server. So it's moving a partition or copying a partition over to another node. And when it's complete, it signals that it no longer owns the original server, uh, signals that it no, no longer owns that partition, and the new server now owns it. And that, uh, that act, actually, that signal changes the cluster map. Um, and then, you know, clients get updated and other servers get updated. So it is actually moving it. Um, well, it's copying it, and as new data comes in, it's also being copied over to the new server during rebalance. And then once it's, once it's, once it's complete, it'll signal that it no longer owns that partition. So here I'm re removing a server from this four node cluster, and it's moving all the partitions that were on this 
first server here to these other three. It's moving it. And once it, when it's complete, it'll say, I no longer own the partitions that were on my server, and the other ones become the actives. Perfect. Thank you. So let's conclude the presentation, then we can answer uh, more questions at the end. Okay. All right. Well, that actually is the end of the presentation. <laughs> and I, I, didn't, I talked mostly about Couchbase Server and the architecture. Um, and I highly recommend uh, attending Catchbase 1 and 2 where I'll talk more about development, um, uh, setting up SDKs and development and understanding key value patterns and JSON documents, uh, serializing, deserializing, um, and a little bit about um, the clients and how they work. Um, so I highly recommend attending that. Um, and if you guys have any other questions as well, you can always Twitter or on um, email. Uh, I, I, I welcome questions at any time. My email is justdeep at couchbase.com and my Twitter handle is scalable. Um, so I welcome questions anytime. And thank you for attending. Uh, we have a few more questions then that we can answer Good. before uh, wrapping up. Um, so we have a question about uh, how sharding happens in Couchbase. So when you add a, a server, is that sharding? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain it again. I have that slide here. Um, what, we, what our clients do, actually, is it'll hash the key. So you have a key, uh, key value pair. So you have a key for a document and then the value of the document itself. Very similar to a, a hash table or a dictionary. Um, in Java or Ruby or whatever programming language, you have a key value pair. So our hash function hashes that key and it results in a number uh, from 0 to 1023. I believe it's a CRC32 hash. It results in a number from 0 to 1023. Now we also have a cluster map uh, which nodes, which IP addresses have what partitions, are responsible for what partitions. So it's based on that, that number. So if we look up the in the cluster map of partition 25, let's just say this hashes to partition 25. In the cluster map, partition 25 lives on you know this server, and so the the client actually goes directly to that server for your CRUD operations for that key. Now, if there's another key, you know just one at couchbase.com. And that hashes to you know partition 26. Partition 26 might live on a different server, um, and it looks in the map, which it maintains that map. It looks in the map and say, well, partition 26 is on server two, you know, and I'm going to go directly to that for CRUD operations for that key. So it's it's called hash partitioning. Um, some other sharding systems on relational use uh, range sharding. Um, I, I know MongoDB was a range shard for a long time until they recently added a hash shard. Um, what hashing allows you to do is evenly distribute across these partitions. It, it tends to have a much more even distribution. Um, that way when you have multiple servers, like, you know, let's go to this slide. When you have multiple servers and you're hashing to partitions, it, it ends up not being linear. It ends up being very well distributed. So. Uh, if you hash just deep at couchbase.com, it ends up on one server. You hash just deep one, it won't also end up on the same server. The likelihood is almost is very very low that you end up on the same server. So you end up having a, a very good distribution across uh, all your Couchbase nodes, which distributes your CRUD operations across all those nodes. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have about five more minutes for questions. So um, we have a question from Teofil. Um, how many buckets can be installed on a single virtual machine? Um, well, we allocate resources um, per bucket. So let me actually go back to uh, here. So we allocate resources to monitor um, and all the disk I.O. Uh, workers, etc., are per bucket. So the more buckets you have, the more resources required in terms of you know CPU, etc. 
generally speaking, most people just have you know just a few buckets. I mean, there are some strategies for having more than one, but this is basically like having a database. Um, same, the same sort of paradigm as relational is that you're having. This is a database. Um, it also namespaces your keys, so you know you, keys need to be unique within a within a bucket. But generally speaking, uh, it really will depend a little bit on the machines themselves and their capacity. But having about, I'd say, under 15 buckets is recommended um, because you're also, you know, distributing your resources and your RAM quotas across all your buckets. So if you only have eight gigs available on the machine, you know, and you have a lot of buckets, you're you're reducing the capacity of each one. Um, generally speaking, most people have you know, one per application, sometimes two, sometimes three, depending on, there are certain strategies which I'll talk about in uh, Catchbase 103 when we talk about views, there are a few strategies for having multiple buckets um, to reduce uh, the, the content that is being indexed for things that are not being indexed and things like that. Thank you. Um, another question from Jenny. Are all the documents with the same hash value stored on the same partition? Not necessarily. Well, y yes. Yes. There is. There are a lot of conflicts in our partitions, right, in our, in our hash function. We want collisions. Collisions basically mean it, it, you're getting a number from 0 to 10, 23. So obviously, you know, you're not going to have one document per server. So, um, uh, but it's not necessarily linear, so that if I have a key that's just the value A um, and it hashes to say, you know, one, uh, partition one, and then I have the value B, it doesn't necessarily also hash to partition one and might part hash to partition two, um, in which case it's not linear where they live on the same server. Uh, so you do get an even distribution. We've been doing this for many years, and this, our hash function, creates a very good even distribution across all the cluster nodes. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, anything else? Uh, Any uh, yeah, we have one more question from Paul. Okay, sure. Um, what tools are available for backup or restoring and to help with the disaster recovery? Ah, yes. We do have uh, command line tools um, for backup. Uh, it's called CB Backup and CB Restore. And they're, they're in our docs. So, you know, we have uh, command line tools for, you know, backup and restore. Uh, you know, you can do one node at a time, or you can do all nodes, um, and it's a very straightforward um, process of backing up. Generally speaking, in terms of the like resources and I/O writers, which uh, you know, kind of show you here how many I/O writers uh, workers, sorry, I/O workers we have. Um, you know, backups are generally done uh, off-peak. <laughs> I highly recommend not doing it during your peak usage. Um, uh, so backup and restore, CB backup and CP restore can also be scripted really easily. They're just command line tools. Perfect. Thank you, Jasdeep. Um, so with this, we uh, close this training session. Uh, a few announcements before we wrap this up. We have a Couchbase 102 on Thursday, which will be focused on developing with Couchbase. So I recommend anyone who hasn't um, signed up yet to go and register on our website, and we will send a follow-up email tomorrow with the slides and the video, and it will include a link to register for Couchbase 102. Uh, the other announcement is we have a, next Tuesday a webinar on our new product, Couchbase for mobile, which is Couchbase Lite. And it will be uh, a one-hour uh, introduction on how it works and how it was uh, designed. So I recommend anyone who is interested in mobile to go and register for that as well. And uh, with this, uh, I close the session, and I hope to see you guys um, next Thursday for Couchbase 102. Thank you. Thank you.